So I'll just welcome everyone to the uh, North Coventry Township Environmental Advisory Council webinar series. This is actually our final educational webinar in this series. Um, so Great, without you, further ado, uh, I want to introduce Corey Trego, who is a uh, not only a member of the North Coventry Township EAC, but also uh, works at the Chester County Water Authority as a water resources planner. So Corey, thank you very much for agreeing to do this. And uh, the stage is all yours. All right. Well, thank you, John, again. And I'm glad to be here tonight to give a a brief introduction to stream ecology. Um, as John said, I'm Corey Trego. I work with the Chester County Water Resources Authority uh, and also on the North Coventry EAC. Uh, just a, a little bit about my background, uh, just to provide you some additional information. Um, so uh, stream ecology, streams of, of all sorts, they've been a passion of mine uh, for many years. Um, from a young age, I started fishing with my dad and my grandfather. Uh, we would take canoeing and kayaking trips every summer. Uh, so I spent a lot of time in and around streams uh, and really kind of grew to love them. And so when I went to college, um, I got a, a degree in biology, focusing on uh, the stream side of biology. Uh, and I went and got a master's degree at West Virginia University, uh, focused on stream restoration on how we can improve the streams uh, that we've degraded over the years. Whenever I travel, I always try to, to visit local streams, local lakes, local rivers, uh, to see those rivers and see those streams, uh, to get an idea of, of how they change with different landscapes, uh, to appreciate them, to appreciate the wildlife within them. Uh, and it's, it's just so cool how, how they are so different you know, all ac across the globe. And there's so much diversity there. So just a quick outline of my presentation tonight. Um, I'll start off by just briefly giving a definition uh, of what is ecology, uh, kind of walking through why, why we talk about ecology, why it's important. Um, I always start with properties of water when I'm talking about this subject, just because uh, the molecular and the chemical properties of water are so important uh, to the organisms that live in streams. Talk a little bit about uh, some of the characteristics of stream environments how our landscape uh, impacts stream environments, how physical and chemical characteristics influence the species that live there. Talk about some of the human influences on our streams uh, and also ways that we can work to improve our streams. Uh, a little bit of a discussion on the organisms that live in our streams. Um, and I'll wrap up with just a quick touch on wetlands because I think wetlands are really cool systems. Uh, and support a lot of really neat species. So I always just like to touch on the benefits of those. Uh, and then at the end, I'll take any questions. So what is ecology? Uh, ecology, it's the study of the relationships between living organisms and their environment. So tonight we're gonna focus specifically on a few of the many components uh, that influence the ecology of stream environments. Um, sometimes streams are referred to as lodic environments by, by scientists. Uh, so flowing environments. Uh, stream ecology is not rocket science. My one college professor always would joke. Uh, he'd always say, you know, rocket science is the study of a projectile moving through a vacuum. He's like, but stream ecology is much more complex than that. There's a lot more factors that influence stream ecology, that influence the organisms that live there, uh, and how they interact with the physical parameters of their habitat, uh, they have the landscape around their habitat, uh, and then with each other. Uh, so there's ultimately there's nearly limitless factors uh, that influence this complex web of interactions. And I always find the more you learn about this, uh, the more exciting it becomes, the more interactions uh, kind of become clear and apparent. Uh, and it just makes it a fun topic to continually dive into because you can never learn too much about it. All right. So. Uh, you know, one of the reasons why I love stream ecology are the organisms that live in our stream, in our riparian corridors. Um, you know, any kind of waterways on our landscape are so rich with diversity, um, you know, specifically, you know, animal diversity and, and plant diversity. And so, you know, just to highlight a few facts real quick. Uh, so we have about 159, 160 species of fish that live in Pennsylvania. Um, the one here on the top left is a brook trout. 
uh, that was caught in French Creek State Park. Uh, so we do have brook trout nearby. There are state fish uh, and they are a very beautiful, beautiful trout. Uh, they can be very colorful, especially in the fall. Um, we have 14 different species of turtles in Pennsylvania. Um, and most of these species, I think 12 or 13 of those species are dependent either partially or fully on aquatic environments. So anytime you go down to any kind of water body, um, you're likely to see turtles. Uh, in North Coventry in, in particular, I was down at Kenilworth Pond a couple times this spring, and it's amazing how many turtles bask around the edge of Kenilworth Pond. Um, even something like that in a relatively suburban environment still supports a lot of really cool and unique species. We have 16 species of frogs and toads, uh, like the green frog showed down here. Uh, he was great and, and posed for me to take a great photo. Uh, we have hundreds of species of birds. I think we have over 400 species of birds in, in uh, Pennsylvania, that frequent Pennsylvania. Uh, and many of those species of birds are reliant in one way or another on our streams, our rivers, and our lakes. Uh, this guy here is a great blue heron. Uh, I always enjoy watching them, except for when I'm trout fishing and they're stealing my trout. Um, we have a lot of mammals that also rely on our stream corridors. Uh, this is a fawn that I walked up on a couple years ago, uh, actually in a project that we did where it was totally mowed grass before uh, cows had access to it and there was no vegetation along the stream. Two years later, I was walking through there. There was knee-high grass, trees that we had planted, and I almost stepped right over this little guy. Uh, just goes to show, you know, what type of species can come into our streams uh, if they're given the chance to flourish. And then we have hundreds and hundreds of species of insects that live within our streams, like this mayfly here. Um, the, the cleaner your water is and the, the healthier your stream habitat is, the more these insects will live there, uh, especially species like mayflies, stoneflies, and caddisflies. And I'd be remiss if I didn't note that in addition to all those animal species that rely on our stream and riparian corridors, we also have a great wealth of, of plant species as well. Um, I was taking a few of these pictures just in the past couple of weeks. Uh, these here, these are trout lilies. Uh, that was along Six Penny Creek in French Creek State Park. Um, they're beautiful. They're popping up all over the place. Um, blue flag iris here, uh, another species that's common along our wetlands and our lakes. Uh, these were cattails out here from a, a wetland site that I manage uh, with CCWRA. New York ironweed with a tiger swallow, uh, tiger, tiger swallow butterfly. Uh, this is from, uh, I believe this is from Coventry Woods just a couple of weeks ago. I was out hiking there and it's a bunch of skunk cabbage popping up in the areas where the springs come out of the mountain, uh, just uh, upstream of uh, or up gradient of Pigeon Creek. And then this is another spot from one of the wetlands that I help manage. Uh, it's, it's swamp milkweed, and that is a, a monarch butterfly caterpillar on there uh, feeding on that milkweed to uh, help to get some toxins that'll, that'll save it uh, when it's an adult and when it migrates down to Mexico. So you know, just to kind of start this off, uh, many, many species rely on our stream and riparian corridors. Uh, they support a lot, of, um, a lot of species and a lot of beautiful, uh, beautiful areas as well. All right, so I always like to start, you know, discussions about stream ecology uh, with a quick overview of the chemical properties of water, uh, because water is so important to all the organisms that live, uh, live in streams. Uh, there's a lot of really cool properties of water uh, that make it really unique, um, and that if it wasn't just right, we wouldn't have these species uh, living in our streams and our lakes. So kind of rewinding back real quick, uh, I'm gonna take you back to, to high school chemistry just for a second. Um, but just remember that water, uh, it's composed of an oxygen atom. So that's this big red atom here, uh, and then two hydrogen atoms. And it's that unique molecular shape and that molecular structure uh, that make water, that makes water a really unique, uh, unique molecule that has a lot of really great properties um, that we don't see uh, in any other molecules that we have here on Earth. So this structure of water, we have this oxygen atom that has a negative charge. These hydrogen atoms, they have a positive charge, um, which makes water what we call a polar molecule, which makes it a great solvent. So why does that matter for stream ecology? Um, water can dissolve many, many, many things. Uh, it can dissolve salts and it can dissolve sugars, but it can also dissolve things like gases. 
So com you know, compounds like oxygen and nitrogen from our atmosphere, they can dissolve in water, uh, which allows organisms under the water to breathe, uh, you know, through gills or through their skin like amphibians. Um, so, you know, very critical that it is a solvent. Um, water, because of this, this uh, polarity, so the negative and positive charges, it also has viscosity and surface tension. So that means that things that fall on the water, like, you know, like a bug or a leaf, um, they can stay on top of the water for a while because there's that viscosity and surface tension. That allows things like fish to be in the water and to look up and see things floating on the top and to go up and to eat them. Uh, it allows things like water striders and riffle beetles to stay on top of the water um, and to, to serve the unique role that they serve within our ecosystems. Water is also, um, it varies, the density of water varies with temperature. So water actually has a crystalline structure, which, you know, when it freezes, it forms ice. Ice is less dense than water, as you know. Um, so anytime water freezes, it gets colder. Um, once it gets to 39 degrees, that's the most dense water will be. So cold water will drop in a system. Uh, warm water typically rises, but when water gets colder than 39 degrees, it actually rises again. Uh, that's why ice floats. This is really important because in big rivers and lakes, that cooling and warming of water causes water to move up and down in the water column, which mixes you know, not only oxygen into the water, but also mixes a lot of nutrients, um, which again, it supports a lot of the species that live there. And then uh, one of the, the most important things that we see is that water has what's called a high specific heat capacity. And that just means that uh, because of its shape and because of its, its um, negative and positive charges, it takes a lot of energy to warm water up. So, you know, things like, um, like an alcohol, that warms up really quickly and evaporates really quickly. But water, you know, even if the air temperature, you know, warms and cools very quickly, water is much more moderated, which again, it helps those organisms that live within the system. Uh, it helps them to, to live there uh, and to thrive and flourish. So what is a stream? Uh, ultimately, you know, streams, they're full of water. So body of water with a current that is confined within a bed and stream banks is the definition of a stream. Uh, one thing I always like to point out is people often you know, think of streams as collecting water that runs off of the land surface um, and, and diverting it downstream. And, and that's important, um, but we have to remember that most of the time, you know, over 90% of the time, Streams are not actually water running off of the land surface or water running just below the land surface, but it's actually groundwater contributions um, coming up you know, from, from below, um, you know, making its way down from the hills and the valleys, collecting at a low point, um, and then of course, you know, moving down to our rivers and to our oceans. Um, this groundwater contribution, that's called the base flow of streams. And it's always important to remember um, that if we pollute our groundwater, or if we use too much of our groundwater, that's when we're really gonna see streams, uh, streams impacted by our activities. So it's not just important to uh, take into account what happens on the surface of the land that runs into the water, but it's also important to make sure that we don't pollute the subsurface because all that water, uh, water that we drink in our wells, um, you know, any kind of water that, that ends up infiltrating into the ground, that eventually makes its way down to our streams. So pollutants that enter that will eventually get into our waterways. All streams are a part of a watershed. So a watershed is just an area of land where all the water that drains off of that or that lands on that surface of land, that water will collect in a, a single place, uh, whether that is a river or a, a stream or a lake. Uh, there's many different size watersheds. So in Chester County, uh, we have 21 major watersheds. And as you can see, North Coventry, uh, we're all the way at the top of Chester County there. Um, about 80% of Chester County flows to the Delaware River. Uh, so it's part of the much larger Delaware River watershed. Um, and that's things, let's see. So like the Brandywine, Brandywine down here, the White Clay, the Red Clay, uh, French Creek, Pickering Creek, Pigeon Creek, the Schuylkill River, all of those make their way down to the Delaware River and out to the Delaware Bay. Um, the streams like Octorero Creek, Big and Little Elk Creek, they end up eventually going either to the Chesapeake Bay or down to the Susquehanna River. So 
uh, 21 you know, major watersheds in Chester County, but ultimately flowing to two large river systems. If we zoom this in a little bit to North Coventry Township, uh, you can see, so the Schuylkill River is up here in the north, uh, Pottstown is over here. Um, this is our, our border with Berks County. Um, we come down here and this is uh, Warwick over here, South Coventry down below us, and then East Coventry to our east. Um, so in North Coventry, we have a lot of smaller watersheds, uh, including Rock Run, which, which is up here, uh, and that flows down into French Creek. We have Mill Creek, uh, which drains over here uh, in the far western par portion of the, the, um, the township. So that's, that's mostly over in French Creek State Park, uh, off of St. Peter's Road there. We have Shankle Hollow Run. So all these little streams over here eventually go into Berks County to the Schuylkill, that's Shankle Hollow Run. Uh, and then Pigeon Creek down here uh, flows kind of right through you know, almost the center of the, uh, of the township. Uh, making its way down into East Coventry. Um, and then we have Bickle Run over here, which again eventually flows down into French Creek. And then Kenilworth Creek up here, uh, going down uh, through Kenilworth Park and then out to the Schuylkill River. So those are just some of our local watersheds. So streams, um, they're not, you know, this homogenous thing. They're, they're composed of very diverse habitats. Uh, and individual species are adapted to specifically occupy um, specific types of that habitat. Uh, so the general features of a stream are shown on this diagram. So uh, when I say riparian or riparian corridor, I'm talking about the, the meadows, the forests, the area directly adjacent to streams. Uh, so that's this area kind of right here. We, we often want to see areas in the riparian corridor uh, forested with trees, or mature meadows, um, we want to make sure that we don't get in there and we don't develop that because that has a really big impact on the quality of our streams. The floodplain is the area adjacent to a stream. Um, that's the area that when you get a big rain event, the stream comes up and over its banks and eventually flows out into the floodplain. These are very rich areas. Uh, again, they have a, support a lot of different plant species, a lot of different animal species. Um, and they're continually replenished by nutrients from that stream that are deposited every time it floods. Streams have pools, which are those deeper sections down here. Uh, and then typically they have riffles if it's a, a healthy headwater stream. Riffles are those shallow areas of faster velocity uh, and they really help to oxygenate the water. Uh, and then ultimately, uh, this all flows within the stream channel. So that's the area um, confined by a stream's banks. This is just another little diagram that kind of highlights this. Again, riffles are those faster moving waters, very shallow, usually a lot of rocks in there. Runs are just below a riffle, um, shallower but not as deep as a pool. Usually you get your pools to form uh, in your corners of your stream. So when a stream bends, it oftentimes will erode away an area and form a pool. Um, and each one of these individual components of a stream uh, there are many species that are specifically adapted to those individual habitats. And so streams, uh, they're not stagnant. They're, they're ever-evolving systems um, that are really significantly influenced by the landscapes around them. Everything from geology of an area, uh, the slope of an area around a stream, uh, its general terrain, the shape of a watershed, you know, the vegetation around a stream, soils, climate, all of these influence a stream's physical and chemical uh, parameters. And of course, the physical and chemical parameters of a stream influence the organisms that live within that, that section of a stream. Um, so the, the study uh, of the interactions between the physical shapes of rivers, their water and the sediment that they transport and the landforms that they create, uh, that's called fluvial geomorphology. That's uh, a whole field you can go and you can get you know, a PhD uh, researching fluvial geomorphology, studying how streams interact with the landscapes around them, uh, you know, the physical landscapes around them. So this is a, a geographical process. Um, just one thing I wanted to highlight on here, uh, you know, very broadly, there's kind of three main areas that we look at uh, when we're talking about a stream or a watershed. So that's the source zone. So those are the headwaters. Uh, typically, these are high gradient, you know, 
uh, in, in more high elevation areas with steep valley walls. Uh, they usually have a lot of pools, high oxygen, cold water. Uh, we have our transition zones. So it's a little bit further down where we have, you know, not as steep valley walls. The gradient becomes less. The stream gets a little bit wider. Um, our temperature usually warms up a little bit. Uh, and we have, you know, a different suite of species that occupies that area. And then as you move all the way down, you know, closer to, um, you know, a larger floodplain area, um, larger flat plains, um, you typically get your floodplain zone. Um, and those are areas that are wide. Those streams, uh, they might meander a little bit. Uh, you know, the banks are usually lower. So every time it floods, that water spills out over onto its banks. Water is usually warmer, slower. Uh, and it supports a very different group of species than that in the transition zone and the source zone. And so just a couple of examples. Um, these are from, Pen two of them are from Pennsylvania. Uh, one of these are from the headwaters in West Virginia. Uh, but headwater streams, this is up in uh, Sullivan County. Uh, a lot of times in the mountainous regions, they look like this. So, you know, they're steep. Uh, they have these cascades that go into pools. Um, and they're really, really scenic areas, uh, usually very cold and support species like brook trout, um, stoneflies, mayflies, caddisflies. And then your transition zones might look a little bit like this, where your velocity is still pretty, pretty decent. Um, your tr tree canopy is opening up a little bit, so your water warms up a little bit. Um, and you have a little bit more habitat, like slower pools, uh, slower runs. Um, and you have a different suite of species. You might have things like smallmouth bass, uh, largemouth bass living in environments like that. And then as you move a little bit further downstream, you end up with these wide floodplain valleys uh, and you get more like species um, like carp, like catfish, um, species that can tolerate much warmer water temperatures, um, much slower water, uh, lower dissolved oxygen levels within the stream. And around here, these look something like this. So this is Six Penny Creek. Uh, it's a very clean headwater stream in French Creek State Park. This is French Creek itself, uh, just down off of Pewtown Road. It's a good example of a transition stream where you have you know, a little bit of high gradient. You have a number of riffles and a number of pools, um, but it's, it's still relatively cool. Um, it's, it's kind of a good transition zone. It supports species like, uh, like sunfish and like bass. And then this is the, the Brandywine down lower in the Brandywine in Southern Chester County, um, where it's wide, it's a little bit warmer, it often spills out onto its floodplains, um, and it supports a lot more species, like it supports bass, but a lot of times you have more carp, more catfish, and species that are adapted to warm water conditions. So just a key takeaway from this section, um, no two streams are alike, and landscape variables play a very prominent role in influencing uh, the physical and the chemical characteristics of stream environments. And I, I always love these two pictures because these represent areas in a stream uh, of, of relatively similar size watershed. Uh, the picture on the left, it's the Ho River in Olympic National Park in Washington, um, you know, fairly high up in, in the Olympic forest. Uh, but you can see there's a lot of, uh, you know, pumice material, a lot of volcanic stuff that gets washed out of those mountains. Uh, very, very wide, very meandering streams. Um, it has a lot of snow melt in the wintertime, which causes it to have this you know, very broad channel with a lot of ice scour. And then a similar watershed in Pennsylvania. This is Pine Creek in North Central PA. Um, very different characteristics, very different um, structure. Uh, than what we see in the Ho River. And it's really all due to the geography around these streams, uh, to the landscapes through which it flows. And so uh, next, I just wanna highlight some of the, the stream physical characteristics that influence uh, species that live there. So we've touched on this a little bit, but um, the biggest impact on which, which species can live in a given stretch of stream is likely temperature. Um, so temperature drives a lot of the geochemical processes in a stream. And what I mean by that is, you know, when you have higher temperature, you typically have uh, faster molecules moving, so you have more energy into the system. That means that chemical reactions occur more quickly. Um, so this results in things like um, you have lower dissolved oxygen because those oxygen molecules have more energy. They can bounce around and they exit the stream water 
Um, so you get lower dissolved oxygen and you can't support as many fish species. Um, you have things like increased photosynthesis. So you have uh, a lot of times algae that, that occurs and that leads to higher nutrient rates. Uh, and again, that can further drop your dissolved oxygen. Your geology, so the, the physical rocks that are you know, underlying streams, uh, that has a, a very large impact. Uh, things like pebble size in a stream uh, has a very significant impact on what type of bugs can live in a stream. Uh, and bugs ultimately influence what type of fish species can live in a stream. And so geology, you could have something like karst. So shown here in the center here, this is green. Uh, this green area here is karst or limestone. Um, that has a lot of springs in it. And so that type of geology supports a lot of colder water. And as you can see over here, all these blue lines and green lines, those are the, the trout streams in Chester County. And most of those trout streams flow through the middle of the county where we have areas of limestone geology. So geology, um, you know, not only can it, can it lead to, you know, variations in water uh, quality, but it can also influence things like temperature. You have things like light. Uh, the more light you have, higher temperature, uh, the higher productivity. Um, and if you get too high a productivity, that can be bad because you have too much algae. Clarity, uh, when you have things like erosion, um, stormwater running off of a landscape, bringing silt and sediment and things like that into streams, that results in turbidity and reduced clarity, um, which can also have a very big influence on how uh, a stream bed is structured. So you can have uh, macro invertebrates that are completely wiped out because you have too much silt and sediment um, that are washed in, that end up settling out on those low areas of stream, um, and they clog all those small spaces that those bugs love to occupy. Uh, and then you have stream hydrology. Um, so hydrology is just um, you know things like how water moves from the surrounding landscape you know down into the stream system. So things like how much groundwater do you have. Uh, what is the slope? So how quickly is water running off? Um, you know, what, how does that influence the, the stream channel or the bed? Um, again, all these things have, have impacts on what type of species can live in a given stream. So dissolved oxygen, so these are chemical characteristics of streams. Um, when you have cold water, you have dissolved oxygen that usually is somewhere around 10 milligrams per liter. Um, you have fish species like your brook trout, your brown trout. Um, your, your dace species or sculpin that need high oxygen levels to survive. And so they like these areas uh, that have fast moving water, lots of riffles uh, to help oxygenate it. When you have slower stagnant water like this, your oxygen levels drop down um, and it significantly limits the number of species that can live there. Um, usually when you have higher nutrients, so you have things like uh, people's lawn fertilizers or fertilizers used on agricultural properties. They can wash into streams um, and cause things like harmful algae blooms that create things like cyanotoxins, um, which can again that can result in you know not only a a uh, an actual chemical that results in in death of species, but it can also lead to a drop in dissolved oxygen as those algae flourish and die, and bacteria eat them up and uh, use up all the oxygen. pH so things like uh, acid rain um, using salts or heavy metals from industry. All that can wash into streams and it can drop the pH. Uh, and again, that, that impacts what species can live there. Uh, and conductivity, we see things like salt influencing conductivity. So in Chester County, um, we've seen a significant increase over the years in conductivity and in chloride concentrations, so in salt concentrations in our streams across the county. And this is especially pronounced in these top two lines you can see here, that's Valley Creek and Chester Creek which are down in the more suburban and urban parts of the county. Um, we're finding that salt levels have been rising since the 40s when they started using road salts to de-ice our roadways. Um, and as salt slowly climbs up, and it's been climbing more fast, uh, more quickly in the last couple of decades, uh, it's approaching DEP's standard for potable water of 250 milligrams per liter. Um, and that's in, in times when we're not actually seeing snow on the ground. So so we're getting data like this in October, you know, many months after we've seen any kind of snow or any kind of salt spread onto the roadways, which tells us, uh, like I mentioned before, this is during base flow conditions, 
So that's when the groundwater is feeding streams. So it's indicating that we have things like high salt in our groundwater. If we actually look at the data um, in January and February after snow events and after they're spreading salt on the, on the road, we see spikes like this uh, in conductivity and in chloride, which are many times higher than what we see in our base flows. Uh, and again, when you have these high salt level levels, that can do things like reduce your pH um, and it can make it more, more acidic, um, which can result in fewer species living there. It has a big impact on things, especially like mayflies, stoneflies, and caddisflies, um, which are those insects that form the base of our food chain in many of our local streams. So how do people impact stream environments? Um, four main ways that we're gonna just briefly touch on. Uh, impervious cover, uh, blocking the stream channel so, so organisms can't move upstream, agricultural impacts, and chemical impacts. So this is a map of Chester County um, and the red streams on here, so all these red lines on here are all streams that are listed as impaired by the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection. So it's, uh, we have about 1,394 miles of streams that are assessed by DEP. 69% of those stream miles have been listed as impaired, which means they're not meeting the, the water quality standards that the DEP has set out for them. And so the biggest cause of that in Chester County um, are things like impervious cover. So as we have more and more development, um, what this means is there's less area for rainwater to hit the ground and to slowly infiltrate in and to recharge our aquifers and eventually to make its way down and recharge our streams. Instead with all this impervious cover, so things like sidewalks, roofs, uh, parking areas, roadways, water hits that and it flows directly into storm sewer systems. And if they're not well designed or directed to some sort of thing like a detention basin or an infiltration basin, they flow down into our streams with a lot of energy um, and they lead to eroding stream banks like this. All that eroding stream banks, um, all that sediment, all that material that's pushed into our streams very quickly after a storm event, um, it pushes its way downstream, scours a lot of area out and ultimately uh, has a very large impact on habitat. So it's important uh, to remember to manage our stormwater properly, uh, to make sure that we're having water infiltrate into the ground, not just running off to our streams uh, through storm sewer systems. Uh, blockages to aquatic organism passage. So uh, one of the biggest disruptions that we've seen to uh, stream ecology in Chester County, um, you know, all throughout the Northeast is from blockages like dams, like culverts um, that prevent organisms from swimming upstream um, and you know, kind of just serve as, as a complete barrier. And so um, when you have something like a dam or a culvert, uh, organisms generally, they move upstream and downstream throughout their lifetime. And when they do that, uh, they have a really significant impact on, uh, on that stream ecosystem. So when, when organisms move upstream to spawn, uh, spawn and, and you know, oftentimes like shad and salmon, they, they might move up and they'll, they'll die eventually. Um, that brings nutrients upstream and it, it helps to just have a nutrient exchange between upstream and downstream ecosystems. They provide food for a lot of those organisms, um, you know, like birds and a lot of predatory mammals that live along streams. So if we block these systems off, uh, they can't move up and downstream um, and we have a, a disruption to our aquatic ecosystems. Barriers like this also influence uh, the channel upstream and downstream. Uh, resulting in usually a lack of small sediment below the stream. Uh, and usually you get a lot of sediment that piles up behind these systems, which again, it, it can lead to poor habitat, both downstream and upstream of these features. So blockages um, to aquatic organism passage. So ultimately it's resulted in big declines in both our anadromous and our catadromous fish species. So anadromous species, uh, they're things like the American eel, um, shown down here. Uh, I know people might not always like eels, but they're really fast, fascinating fish. Uh, they can grow you know, several feet long, um, just really unique. And we often had a lot of eels back here, uh, back in Chester County decades ago, 
but our numbers have plummeted significantly because of all the dams that we have, especially on the Schuylkill River, that prevent uh, these organisms from moving upstream. So these are anadromous, so they actually live most of their life uh, in streams. Uh, I'm sorry, these are catadromous. So they live their life in streams, um, and then they go out and they go down to the Sargasso Sea in the Atlantic Ocean to spawn, uh, and they come back and they live in their streams again. Uh, we have other species like shad. So shad used to also swim up the Schuylkill River, swim up the Brandywine Creek every year. Um, but because of all the dams that we have, these species, you know, they can't ultimately swim up to spawn. Um, they live most of their life out in the ocean. So they used to be really important, you know, not only as a food source to people, but they would come up and they would bring a lot of nutrients from the ocean. You know, they fed out there, they grew, they got very big. Uh, they'd bring all those nutrients back inland and they'd have that important nutrient exchange between our ocean environments and our stream environments. We have things like agriculture, uh, where we have all these increased nutrient levels um, because we have things like manure going into streams or eroding stream banks, which also results in elevated stream temperatures. And so if we're not careful, um, we can have you know, a system that looks something like this, if it's in its pristine state, uh, pristine state supporting organisms like brook trout, uh, which are native brown trout, which are not native, but they uh, are thriving pretty well here, are popular game fish species. Um, but they're all indicative of high water quality. You can have a system become something more like this, uh, highly eroded, high water temperatures, and supporting a much lower number of species, uh, species that are typically not, not as valued, um, like suckers here. And so uh, what can we do to prevent this? Um, we have a, a big impact on our environment, so we can do a lot uh, to limit our influence. So we can have things like um, what we call best management practices, or BMPs are often shortened to. Um, things like rain gardens, which you can help direct your stormwater runoff into these. They infiltrate water, capture a lot of nutrients and sediment, and prevent that from running down into our streams, which improves water quality. Uh, this is the Westchester roof of the library. Uh, at Westchester University, it's roof. Uh, they installed a green roof. So roofs, you know, they collect water when it rains, uh, it runs down into our streams. Oftentimes it gets very hot. Um, but if you have a green roof, that absorbs rainwater, prevents it from running off into our streams. Uh, and again, just has, uh, you know, provides new habitat, different habitat, improves water quality. You can do things like putting rain barrels in, which again, capture runoff from your property store them for a while so you can use them to water your garden. So it's not all running off the, uh, running off of your property into the storm sewer systems or onto the roadway uh, and running down the streams, causing uh, all that erosion and all that sedimentation. A lot of agriculture operations are putting in many BMPs like riparian buffers or doing things like uh, putting in stream bank restoration projects. So when you take a stream and you plant trees along it, you not only improve the water quality by reducing temperature and improving habitat, um, but you're also uh, just you're generally improving the amount of, of species that will live in that area um, and improving, you know, if you have a farm operation, ultimately improving that farm operation as well because you have cleaner water uh, that you're able to utilize for your animal species. And so uh, we always look at things like riparian buffer widths. So the bigger your buffer width, uh, the better, the more impact it has on, on uh, water quality and on uh, wildlife that live there. So if you have just 20 feet of buffer, you can have your stable stream banks and, and solid aquatic food webs. But if you go all the way up to 100 feet, uh, you can see things like you know, flood mitigation. So reducing the amount of flooding you have while also having great habitat and travel corridors for a lot of wildlife species. All right, so as we're wrapping this up a little bit, um, last I'm just gonna talk about the actual organisms that live within our stream. Um, and I always like to touch on, you know, kind of the base of this is the stream food web. Um, so there are, you know, nearly limitless variations on food webs and they are constantly changing throughout the year, uh, even from day to day. And ultimately, as I've been kind of talking throughout this, the changes that happen on the landscape have a profound impact on the food web within a stream, uh, which impacts the whole energy system within that stream environment. So a basic food web 
you know, it always starts with the sun. All the energy on Earth comes from the sun. Um, it comes down, hits the stream. Um, you get things like small algae growing in there, mosses, um, you know, trees even with leaves that fall into the stream. That provides the basis for our food webs. And you have things like bacteria and our little benthic macroinvertebrates that live in there and they shred these organisms up. Uh, they eat them and, and that's what they flourish on. As they, they grow, you know, bugs can be very small and there's bigger predatory bugs. Uh, ultimately, that's what many of our fish species end up eating. Um, so that's just a very simple food web. But there's always a cool study that I like to reference uh, that kind of, you know, highlights very well, I think, how much of an impact our landscape has on the health of our stream systems. Um, so there was a guy named Shigeru Nakano um, back in the late 90s. He studied how food webs, uh, how they change when terrestrial inputs. So when things like even just bugs falling in from trees next to a stream, how much that stream changes from that. So to simulate somebody cutting down the forest around a stream, he took these plastic tarps and kind of put them over top of the stream, um, which prevented any kind of bugs, any kind of leaf litter from falling into these waterways. And what he found is that all the organisms in that stream completely shifted their behavior um, and caused what we call a trophic cascade, which altered the stream environment. So it, resolved, it resulted in things like trout shifting their feeding behavior uh, to eat more of the small bugs on the bottom of the stream. Those bugs kept the algae in check. So as they disappeared, we had increased algae levels. And ultimately over time, the entire stream environment changed you know, relatively quickly uh, just from the removal of those terrestrial inputs. So what we do on the, the landscape adjacent to the stream, again, it has a big impact on the health of the stream itself. I mentioned this kind of throughout the presentation, um, but there's a, a theory called the ecological niche theory. Um, and that is that, you know, each species is adapted to occupy its own unique habitat. Um, and when conditions change, you know, one species may be better occupied to alter to occupy that habitat than another species. Unfortunately, when things change too quickly, um, so when we alter stream environments and they change very fast, so whereas they may change over many decades or hundreds of years, when, when people come in and put in a development or put in a dam or put in a roadway next to a stream, that changes the, the system so quickly that species may not be able to move and to adapt quickly enough. Um, and you get sections of stream that are void of you know, almost all kinds of life that have just the most tolerant species present. And so um, there are species that are adapted to occupying in a narrow range of temperature. Those are called steno stenotherms. Uh, they're usually things like trout species. And you have things like urotherms, which can occupy a wider range of temperature. And over millennia, these species, they can move about and they can occupy things um, you know, differently when, when uh, conditions change. But when they change too quickly, we don't see that movement. Um, and, and we get a, a very big disruption in how that whole system functions. And so um, just kind of closing out here a little bit, uh, there's this concept called the river continuum theorem. And uh, this was kind of, uh, kind of highlighted or, or thought up by uh, somebody named Robin Van Oet. And uh, Van Oet says, a stream is fundamentally different from a lake, and you must consider how the entire system is functionally linked. Because a river changes constantly as it moves downstream, it can only be understood as a continuum. Um, so rivers, you know, what happens in the headwaters, what happens in the tributaries, it impacts the entire system. So I think it's always important to remember, uh, if you cut off, you know, one thing up in the headwaters and you take one section of headwater stream and you cut the forest down and you build, you know, directly adjacent to that stream channel, that impact is not only on that individual section of stream, um, but the changes that are, that occur there, uh, they, they can, you know, signal much greater changes or occur much greater changes to happen further downstream. Um, it can result in a whole disruption. Uh, to the food web, to the organism, organisms that occupy uh, that continuum. And so uh, just kind of, you know, highlighting some of these species that we see in our streams locally when the water is cold and water is clear. Um, you see things like uh, sculpin. Uh, we don't have as many of these around here because we don't have as many cold streams, but in French Creek State Park, on those cold, pristine waterways that are forested, we do see those. 
we have things like our mayflies here. Um, stonefly here, mayfly over here. Um, again, these are species indicative of good water quality, and they're great food for species like brook trout. So we have brook trout. Um, they're kind of our iconic cold water species, and they would have occupied many of our streams in this area before, uh, before this area was cleared and farmed and settled. Um, this is kind of like the pinnacle of, of pure and pristine streams in this area. And then we see a lot of things like rosy side dace, which is just a minnow, but it can be very colorful and very beautiful. Uh, and again, you see those usually in our colder, cleaner stream communities. In our uh, slightly warmer stream communities, like the Schuylkill River, we see things like smallmouth bass, uh, like up here in the top left. Uh, things like sunfish, um, things like suckers or river red horses, like shown here, channel catfish. And instead of seeing mayflies and stoneflies and caddisflies, we often see things like uh, dragonfly and damselfly larvae, like shown here. Um, but in our in our warmest streams and most impacted streams, we don't even see those species. Um, so, just kind of highlighting, you know, if we keep our small small streams clean and clear. Uh, these are the type of species we should expect to see. If we keep our larger streams you know, clean and clear, uh, we expect to see things like healthy smallmouth, healthy sunfish, uh, dragonflies and damselflies living in those environments. So you know, that, that should be our goal. That should be our standard. And just to close out, like I said, I love wetlands. Um, they are great areas of, of unique habitat that support a lot of really cool species, especially bird species. Um, and I always get calls with people saying, hey, I have a wet area, I want to fill it in. So I always conclude with this when I'm presenting on stream ecology that, you know, wetlands or areas you might say are just wet. Um, they, they have an impact on water quality. Um, they can do things like store floodwaters. They really have a big water quality improvement because, you know, water enters those wetlands and it infiltrates into the ground. Uh, so it recharges our groundwater, which ultimately leads to better stream flows and healthier stream flows because it's better water quality. And again, they provide excellent habitat for fish and wildlife species. So uh, with that, I, I'm just gonna summarize with a few conclusions. Um, you know, one is our stream systems, they're complex and they're ever changing. You know, oftentimes they change relatively slowly over time, um, but if we come in and we, and we don't you know, take into consideration uh, how development impacts streams, they can change very quickly and too quickly for the species within them to adapt. Um, and it can lead to very, you know, very significant, very um, pronounced changes in, you know, not only water quality, but within the organisms that thrive within those stream and riparian areas. Um, our physical and our chemical characteristics of streams, they very closely reflect um, geography and geology and the land use that we, we do, uh, the, the way we change the landscape around them. And then anthropogenic, so man-made disturbances, they can cause those substantial shifts, but there's a lot of things that we can do, like install best management practices that can reduce or, uh, or completely reverse those influences. And then finally, uh, the organisms that live within a stream, uh, they ultimately reflect the long-term physical and chemi chemical characteristics of that stream. So if you see a stream with organisms like brook trout, mayflies, stoneflies, um, some of those cold water species like sculpin or dace, um, that is a, a, a reflection of that stream uh, has been taken care of you know, for many decades um, and it, it's supporting a healthy ecosystem, supporting high water quality. And again, that should be the standard that we always strive for. Strive for. So uh, with that, I'll, I'll wrap up here and I will take uh, any questions that anybody has. Corey, thank you so much. Great presentation. Um, you know, as a scientist, I'm always interested in seeing, you know, the really scientific look at uh, issues like this. So this was really enjoyable. Thank you. Uh, a couple of a couple of questions. I mean, one of the things that that struck me is, you know, I think of Chester County as a place that is, you know, pretty enlightened when it comes to ecological issues. Um, and yet, when you, sh you showed a map that I thought was very telling about uh, stream impairment, um, noting that almost every stream in the southern, certainly third of Chester County, 
is listed as impaired. Um, certainly a lot of them are to the north as well, but especially those to the south. Um, is, is there more that, that we can do to improve those waterways um, and, and to keep some of those that are not yet listed as impaired from becoming impaired? Yeah, um, so I guess first I'll start with a quick caveat, and that is that our waterways are cleaner for the most part than they were 40 and 50 years ago. Sure. Um, you know, things like the Clean Water Act have resulted in uh, much improved water quality, um, you know, not only in Chester County, but throughout the United States. Um, so my second caveat is a lot of the streams that are impaired, um, they're impaired based off of the standards that DEP sets for them. And sometimes because of the land use that we have, you know, when, when we have big uh, parking lots and shopping malls and a lot of farmways directly adjacent to streams. Um, you know, especially when those things may be in, have been installed decades ago before people were as aware of the influence that that action has. Um, it's very hard to reverse that. And so even though we've been, you know, very much improved with all the new infrastructure that we put in, um, you know, there are lingering impacts that that will occur for decades. Um, but there are things that we can continue to do. Um, you know, anytime new development goes in, uh, it's always important to have you know good stormwater management systems. Uh, even if you put in you know a big area of pavement or something on your property, uh, especially if you live in a highly suburbanized area, and that uh, pavement might flow to a you know street going to a storm sewer system, it's best if you can direct that um, into something that's going to allow that water to infiltrate. So that'll remove the pollutants from it. Um, it'll remove, um, you know, a lot of the the velocity that would go to our streams, uh, and ultimately result in in more groundwater recharge. Um, you know, a big thing is always uh, not over fertilizing your lawn um, and reducing your lawn area is is very important. Um, you know, if, if you continually put nutrients and you know fertilizers on your lawn. Um, that washes into streams and it causes things like those algae blooms that we see. Um, that a lot of those streams in southern and western Chester County, um, it's from nutrients, you know, whether that's from um, sometimes from agriculture or sometimes from mushroom operations, um, and then sometimes from, from lawn fertilizers. Uh, all that has a compound influence and uh, results in that degraded water quality. So, all right, thanks. Um, another question. Uh, I mean, one of the really important aspects of streams when it comes to uh, the, the organisms that live within them is the amount of dissolved oxygen, which of course is directly tied to temperature of the water. Um, and so, you know, with less cover, with less shade, you get higher water temperatures, lower dissolved oxygen. One of the things that I was wondering about is, I mean, with some other, in some other areas, some other biological systems, we've noticed um, the effects of climate change, you know, and in, in, including, you know, like a, a altered timing of migration patterns, for example. Are we beginning to see that with, with streams and with the level of dissolved oxygen and water temperatures, you know, so that there are you know, fewer streams that are, are cold enough as we, you know, as things warm. Um, is that is that something that has been noticed or is that an issue? Yeah. Um, yeah, so it's something that has certainly been studied. Um, you know, fortunately, dissolved oxygen has increased in most of our streams, mostly because we have less um, pollutants from industry going into them than we had 50 years ago. Um, so it's interesting, when I was in graduate school, um, a, a, one of my fellow grad students wrote a paper called um, something along the lines of, you know, will brook trout survive in you know, these streams, you know, and then the caveat was if it rains. Um, so we are expected to see warmer stream temperatures um, over time because as air temperature warms, stream will warm. Um, but we're also expected to see increasing uh, precipitation as well over the next, you know, century or so. If we continue to see increased precipitation, um, it could, you know, 
could result in better or at least similar dissolved oxygen levels and similar temperature. The caveat is that in places like Chester County, where we have a lot of impervious cover, that rain may not infiltrate into the ground and contribute to that base flow that would keep that stream warm or keep that stream cold um, and keep that stream having high dissolved oxygen. If, if that water just you know, hits impervious surfaces like roadways and gets flushed right down to our rivers and gets flushed downstream very quickly, you know, it, does, it does lead to things like you know, higher temperature spikes, especially when that occurs during the summertime. Um, and it leads to things like stream bank erosion and you know, ultimately that eroding stream bank higher temperatures, it would result in higher or lower uh, dissolved oxygen. So you'd have you know, fewer species that could live there. Right. Um, so it's certainly a worry um, if we don't carefully make sure we manage our stormwater runoff. Thanks so much, Corey, for the presentation. Um, really appreciate it. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I look forward to, to maybe maybe with our next series, you, you know, we can go into a more advanced uh, course on <laughs> uh, water ecology. Yes, absolutely. All right. Thank you guys very All much. Right. Thank Have you a good everyone night. for tuning in. Good night. Yep, thank you.